Are you ready to dive into the message? Good. There is a sentence in the English language that I do not like. There are variations to it, but every time I hear it or read it, let's just say it is not my favorite, and I decided to make it the title of today's message. So how many of you have ever had someone say this sentence to you right here? We need to talk. There are variations to it. There are like, hey, can we talk? Or I need to talk to you. And I am not a fan of this sentence, to say the least. Everything inside of me starts to clam up. My imagination just runs wild immediately. What could they possibly want to talk about? What did I do wrong? What did they do wrong? What are they about to do that's just stupid? Sometimes my response is, absolutely, I would love that. I am lying. If I ever said that, I am lying to you. And sometimes my response, even before they tell me why, I'm already apologizing. I am so sorry for what I did. I, don't, I, I was busy. I was tired. I'm sorry. And so I'm just a bundle of security up here today, Freedom. But if you really want to mess with me, tell me that sentence, we need to talk, and then tell me it can't be right now. We'll have to schedule it for another time in the future. You have just derailed my life until that time in the future. A knot starts to form, double knotted maybe, and it can't be untied until we talk. And then a few days after for recovery, I'm very sensitive. It drives my wife crazy, but I'm letting you in to really me. And so until we talk, I can't start to be okay. But I also don't want to talk right now in the moment because you've already made me not okay. So it's wishy-washy, it's not helpful, it's not healthy. But the truth is, we all need to talk. To which sometimes I'll get a man normally that will say, not me, that's why I don't talk. Don't want any of that drama, don't want any of that. But what you need to know, man, is that when you're not saying something, you really are saying something. That your lack of talking is also causing problems. And all the women said, Amen. So we all need to talk. <laughs> that was the loudest amen of the day, Rising Sun, right there at 11 a.m. We all need to talk. We all need help in our communication. We, could all, we all need help in navigating conflict. And so in this second part to extraordinary relationships, this is what we're going to tackle. But I'm going to start by giving you a mini thesis right here on the screen. Ordinary relationships are possible, but not probable if you do them the world's way. See, the world starts with what's in it for me here? What can I get out of this? What can I get from us? Uh, when you've outlived being useful, then see ya. The world's way is if you wrong me, then I have the right to wrong you. Now, Jesus flips this whole thing on its head, and he says, if you want to be seen as the greatest, start by serving. If you want something, give something. If you want to truly live, then you'll have to die to yourself. Go last, not first. Value the relationship more than being right. Anyone happy they came to church yet? See, Jesus' message is a hard one. And it's not common. And it's not common because it isn't easy. But it really is the reason why there's so much struggle in our relationships. Because the extraordinary that is possible requires a countercultural approach. Uh, I would say an otherworldly approach. Look at Romans 12 too. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. And I would say, especially in the area of our relationships and in when it comes to conflict, but let God, say that word right there. Let God what? Transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So what is God after? He's after transformation. And that word transform, it comes with this idea of being changed after being with. So it's like a, a rubbing off of that takes place. Proverbs says, walk with the wise and become wise. But a companion or a friend of fools, 
he suffers harm. What, what does the scripture mean? It means that we change into who we hang around and who we are listening to the most. As adults, we say this to our kids a lot, but we forget that it still applies when we get older, that we're changing into who we're around or who we listen to. That's why it's so important to guard our inputs, to, to guard who we're listening to. It's why it's important to get around a, a group, a godly group. It's important to go to counseling. It's important to talk with a friend, not who's just simply going through what you're going through, but someone who has gone through it and come out the other side because you need to know that there's hope to overcome whatever it is you're walking through. But what I love about God is God never asks you to change without giving you the ability to do so. That there's something significant, something about getting close to God first, getting in his presence where he then can transform. He can then rub off on us and enable us then to walk like him and talk like him and be like him and respond like him. When we seek him first, everything else then can flow from that. God can get a hold of our heart and then place in us a desire to want to do the things that he's asking us to do. Are you following? See, religion would define it as this. Here's a set of rules. Do these. But God says that that's not how we define this relationship. I say Follow me first, and then the rules will come a whole lot easier because then I'll be able to rub off on you and teach you and transform you and give you the power that you need to want to be more like me. The message version of the same scripture says it like this. Readily recognize what he wants, what God wants from you. And I think actually a, a better way to say this would be readily recognize what God wants for you and quickly respond to it. No delays here. I'm not trying a different way first. No, God, what do you want? Yes, I say yes to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. Preach it. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So the verse is very clear. Say yes to God's way and you will never miss his will. His will for your life, your marriage, your friends, your dating relationships, that it's possible to land on the side of good and pleasing and perfect in our relationships, not just hard and frustrating and unfulfilled like it is for so many. But I believe it takes us starting with, and it takes us depending upon these two things. Number one is a passionate, practical love of God. And number two is how we deal with conflict. So starting with a passionate love of God, loving him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, because that will affect how we see other people, how we think about them, how we love them, how we treat them, how we invest in them. In fact, I think that the single greatest factor maybe of how to keep a healthy heart towards other people is when you see that person as made in God's image and as an individual that Jesus willingly chose to die for. That nothing so radically shifts my personal interactions than this. When I think, wait a minute, God fearfully and wonderfully made them and Jesus sacrificially and willingly died for them. If we all lived with this in mind, with others in mind, things would be different. Is anyone alive in Bel Air today? Am I preaching something you've never heard before? Because extraordinary relationships depend first on a passionate love of God, but then number two, so big, how you and I deal with conflict. So we're going to live there today in the world of conflict, to which everyone was like, woo, I'm so glad that I came. But the Bible has so much to say about conflict. In fact, I could probably argue that it's cover to cover conflict between people, between nations, between us and God. Everywhere you look, there's a conflict. It's crazy. So that means it's a beautiful place for us to look into. So here's a verse I want to give you, and it's a bit of a Cliff's Notes approach, I think to how to deal with conflict, but I think it really packs a punch. So punch your neighbor, and let's read this together. Ephesians chapter 4. Be angry, interesting, and do not sin. 
Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So there's a lot packed in these few words. And so I want to focus on the first two that says, be angry. To which some of you are like, done. Like you had me at those two words. Like, is good. I mean, I'm just never not angry. I'm a Baltimore sports fan. I'm always angry. And for some, this is your new Bible verse. You're just going to say, be angry. Put it up on the fridge. Joey said, it's good. But I pointed out like that just to, to mention to you that the Bible does make allowance for anger. It recognizes that it will be there because conflict is inevitable. If you grew up with siblings, conflict. If you have a weird neighbor, conflict. If you are the weird neighbor, conflict. If you have to drive on 95, conflict. Worse, 695, conflict. If you're stuck behind a Prius on Route 1, conflict. People who purposefully walk in parking lots in the middle when you're driving and you can't get around them, conflict. You notice most of mine involves driving, like you hear that? If you have ever attended a youth sporting event, conflict. Post any opinion, just any opinion on social media, conflict. What a beautiful day we're having. Read the comments. How dare you? That is offensive. There are so many across the world that are not having a beautiful day. Take that down right now. You're like, oh, okay. So with the exception maybe of posting a picture of your puppy, conflict. And even then, they're like, where'd you get your puppy? You could have adopted a puppy. Why'd you go through a breed? Like, there's so much. <laughs> Mention anything about politics, election, just Congress. We have two new curse words in our culture, Biden and Trump. Explosive conflict. <laughs> the enemy has hijacked our emotions. And now what really are seemingly small things caused us to absolutely explode. My point is you can't avoid it. It's everywhere. And all of us kind of have our own way of dealing with it. In fact, there's an article that talks about there are five types of people when it comes to dealing with conflict. So I thought I'd give you that list and make you feel good. Are you ready? Number one, we have the aggressive people. This is what I think, and you're an idiot for thinking anything differently. <laughs> Wonderful people. Next, the indirect aggressive or the passive aggressive. I know I'm right, but I will show my hostility through indirect methods like jokes and making others feel guilty and talking to others about it, backstabbing. Next are the assertives. This is what I think. This is what I feel. This is how I see the situation. Thank you. Nobody asked, but this is the assertive. <laughs> the whiner. I like to just complain, but I am not assertive enough to approach anyone about the situation. And then the passives that are like, this problem definitely will pass if I just bury my head in the sand long enough. The ostriches of the group. This is a great list, right? Everyone feels good about it? Everyone's identifying other people in the list or people are elbowing others. Oh, that's definitely my mom. That's definitely you. That's definitely. <laughs> it's only the aggressives that are like, yeah, that's me. And I'm okay with it. Get over it. Right? So, <laughs> but it's not a great list and there has to be, I believe there is another way because in all that I just described everything, everyone on that list Someone comes out the loser. Someone comes out hurt. There's no growth and there's constant frustration. I think the Bible really is most helpful here because although you and I will never be able to eliminate all conflict on this side of heaven, there are ways to mitigate, ways to handle it that make it possible to come out okay and in some cases to come out better. So let's get back to the scripture. Be angry. Oh no, there's more. It cannot be your favorite scripture anymore. Be angry and do not sin. Because it's not that anger itself is bad. It's what you do with it that can be. That there is good anger, righteous anger. In fact, God gets angry. We see that all throughout scripture. So when is anger good? When, when is it righteous? Well, that depends on what it leads to. 
Nehemiah was angry at the destruction of Jerusalem, so it motivated him to gather people and gather resources and to go to work. See, righteous anger will bring about a certain redemptive action that will see a wrongdoing and, and are motivated to make it right. We may see an injustice in the world and, and start a foundation or a ministry to help those who are experiencing that injustice learn about Jesus and to become healed from it. You'll see uh, organizations that are trying to eradicate human trafficking and poverty and illiteracy and unjust laws. Anger can motivate. Anger can energize. It has the power to do so. But we have to be careful because anger should just be an indicator, not a dictator. See, anger is always or should always be pointing to something. So if it's righteous, it'll maybe point to something that you have the ability maybe to, to tackle and to help. But sometimes anger will point to a flaw within yourself. Why am I getting so upset about this right now? There's an unmet expectation or there's an insecurity. And if left unchecked or if it's channeled incorrectly, anger has the ability to burn the house down, to, to kill and to destroy and to wreck and to, to hurt others, hence all the conflict. So be angry and do not sin. Next part is do not let the sun go down on your anger. And I love this because not all anger is immediately explosive. So Paul is starting to talk to here the stewards in the room. How many of you are the stewards, the ones that just let it kind of boil and, and still thank you for your honesty. And he talks to the stewards and he says, don't be stewing. Don't stew. Don't wait too long to resolve this. It's not good for you. Now, for some, you need to breathe a little bit and you need to take some time because if you reacted when you wanted to, it wouldn't be well, wouldn't be good. But for others, waiting too long is dangerous because the pressure then starts to build and you start building on to the story. You start adding details. You become the, the judge of other people's intentions and you become a dangerous bomb that needs to be diffused ASAP because what's going to happen is the next little thing that goes wrong is going to cause you to explode on someone. And more often than not, we explode on people that weren't even the cause of why we're angry in the first place. Is anyone with me? Be angry, do not sin, don't let the sun go down on your anger, and here's why, here's the big one right here, and give no opportunity to the devil. Why we have to deal with this is because unresolved anger is an invitation for the enemy to come right in. The word opportunity in, in this case actually means to give place to. It means that you're setting up a place for him. It is table for two. The devil is coming to join me. Are you with me? And so Tim Keller said, our culture is becoming littered with enormous numbers of broken and now irreparable relationships. Why? Because of unresolved conflict and anger that gives a place for the enemy to come in and do what he does, which is kill, steal, and destroy. If we leave the door cracked open, guess who's pushing it fully open and taking that opportunity to attack our marriages and attack our relationships and to bring divisions and hopefully beyond repair. But thanks be to God, it doesn't have to be this way for the believer. That with the help of the Holy Spirit... We can recognize that, yes, in all of our relationships, we might have conflict, but extraordinary relationships can have healthy conflict, that there is a healthy side of this. And if you're like me, you know that's true, but man, it's still hard. Healthy conflict that is safe and timely, and that brings resolution, that is resolved. See, the world writes people off quickly. We as the body of Christ don't. The world seeks to cancel. We do not. Uh, our boundaries needed sometimes? Absolutely. Is accountability needed? Is there a commitment sometimes on the part of the person to have to work to rebuild the trust that has been destroyed? Absolutely. But as followers of Jesus, we forgive because we have been forgiven so much more. We love even when it's not easy because God so loved and he still loves us. 
We don't write off and close the door on restoration and reconciliation because Jesus always keeps that door wide open to you and I. We've gotten quiet here in Bel Air, Rising Sun. I just want to make sure that you're aware we're very quiet now. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. You ever just wanted to take like a pen or white out and just scribble out something that's in your Bible. This would be one of those moments for me because he tells us we should rejoice and then tells us this next sentence, strive for full restoration. Strive to encourage each other, to be of one mind, to live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. To which we ask, well, who doesn't want the God of love and peace to be with them? We all do. But striving for peace, striving for restoration is hard. It's heavy. In fact, all day long, the first 10 minutes of the sermon, most people have been like, yep, preach it. Amen. I am with you. The world is angry. I'm angry. I identify with this so much. But Joey, when you start to turn the corner a little bit and we start talking about how God wants to do a work in us and to restore our broken marriage and how he wants to resurrect some faith to believe that he's not done with your son. He's not done with your daughter. He Faith to believe that there's hope with what you're walking through with your dad or your in-laws or your ex or your used to be best friend. Then we're very quick to respond and say, that's good for them. But Joey, you don't know my situation. I tried. I've done what I can. Or even for some, I don't even have the energy to work on it anymore. I'm just done. I've been burned too much. And can I say, you may be right. You've been burned too much. More than you should have been. But remember what God is after. He's after transformation of the heart. And anything that I say today is just going to sound like self-help unless the heart is transformed. Because there's great content everywhere for anger management, how to deal with conflict, how to have a hard conversation, people skills. There's good stuff everywhere. But if our hearts are not positioned right, then there will be little hope. And I know situations on both ends of the spectrum right now. The people that are just done, they've been burned too much. I don't have the energy to head back into this. And the others that are still pleading with God and praying for restoration. And here's what I would say. Both can end up in a dangerous place if your heart doesn't stay right before the Lord. Is this all right, everyone? What Pete said a couple of weeks ago still rings true. All of this, all of our, our brokenness, all of the difficulty in relationships, all of the issues that we face, all of this is a matter of the heart, which is why Proverbs says we guard our heart above all things. Like that is the goal. We guard our heart because out of it flows every issue in this life, all of my issues, all of your issues. And, and, and the danger is that unresolved conflict is a disease that can be deadly. And, and I... For my whole life, I've heard guard your heart, and I love that verse. And I would say that the good thing about it and what tends to happen is we're like, yes, we need boundaries. I will not let people in to hurt me anymore. It is, it is not going to happen. To which I would say halfway you're okay and knowing that it's good to guard your heart. But what we end up inadvertently doing, if we're not careful, we start walling ourselves in and, and we start staying away from the healthy things in our life. And you think you're guarded, but really you've left a crack open for the enemy to come in and to do what he does. Because bitterness and unforgiveness starts as a little seed that can sprout. I'm going to move on, but I know I'm touching a nerve here. And then people laugh at it. It's good. I just, uh... But I want to I help you. I want to help us, really. By wrapping up with a short story from Genesis chapter 50, if you've, if you've never read the story of Joseph, Genesis 37 through 50 covers his life. You could do it in a few minutes. It's well worth it. I think there are four lessons in having to deal with conflict God's way that will really help our hearts just stay in the right place before God and, and give God an opportunity to do what only he can do in us and in our relationship. So we have Joseph, great name, 
good looking. It's like he's standing right here in front of you right now. Just picture him like this. He probably was a little taller because let's face it, everyone is. But he's, he's the great grandson, the great, great grandson, excuse me, of Tara, who Peter talked about a few weeks ago. Tara, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. He's no stranger to conflict. Man, so much of his life just reads like a tragedy. But God had placed favor on his life. But favor doesn't mean no pain and no obstacles. He faced many. He was his dad's favorite son out of the 12. And not the favorite as in he probably was the favorite and everyone guessed. No, the favorite because his dad told everyone, this is my favorite, like get over it. How many of you were the favorite? And just raise your hand. You are or are the favorite. For some reason, Second Gathering had just a slew of favorites. I don't know why they ended up all in that gathering. But being the favorite in that family, it caused an extreme amount of jealousy to the point where the brothers had had it. They stripped him of his clothes. They threw him in a pit. They sold him into slavery. And they go back and tell their dad that Joseph must have died by being attacked by a wild animal. It's a great family we're dealing with here. He was then sold again as a slave into the house of Potiphar, who was an Egyptian official. He was there for years. He was wrongfully accused of rape by, the, by Potiphar's wife because she liked him, wanted him. And he said, no, I will not sin against God in this way. And so he's thrown into prison for more years. It's not going well. But God never left Joseph, was always with him, blessed him where he was. Joseph interprets a few dreams that come true. He interprets a dream for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. It was a, it was a huge deal that got him placed in second command out of, in all of Egypt. And the dream that he interpreted was that they were going to have years of plenty. The crops would be great. But then there would be a famine that would ravage the entire land and region. And we better prepare for it. Otherwise, we're going to be toast. The story is much better than what I'm saying right now. Please read it on your own time. So he's put in charge of all of the resources, all of the storehouses. The famine hits in the region but also in the region where his brothers and his family still live. And so they have to come then to Egypt and come before the man that they betrayed. They don't know who he is at the moment and ask for help. They don't recognize him. It's been years. He's grown up a bit. He's speaking a different language. He walks like an Egyptian. Oh, way, oh. Like he's just different now. Like they don't recognize it. And there's a few chapters of back and forth a little bit where they go back home, they bring food, they have to come buy more. And at some point, Joseph reveals who he truly is and they are in shock. There's this cry fest, as you can imagine. But what makes the story so powerful and the reason why we're looking at it today when it comes to, to recognizing and dealing with conflict is that when they recognize and he reveals himself to them, it's the first time the Bible says the word forgiveness. It's an important story because his brothers are scared to death thinking we are done for after what we did to him. There is no way he's not going to make us pay. Now, why would they think that? Because it's the world's approach to relationships. You hurt me. So I'm going to hurt you. It's only fair and square. You betray me. You deserve to be betrayed. But extraordinary relationships like we are after don't work that way. And lesson number one of the four, when it comes to dealing with conflict, the worst of conflict, Joseph teaches is here, number one, and that's this. It starts within us first. That conflict resolution God's way starts with us. Genesis 50, 19 says, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? And what he means by that what I believe he is saying is this, what right do I have to judge you? And if you approach it like you want to, you would say, he has all the right in the world to judge them after what they did to him. But you can just sense, even before we know more of the story, that Joseph has already let a healing work begin on the inside of him. Before he ever steps into dealing with the conflict publicly, he's first allowed God to come in and do some work on the inside of him so he has a posture of humility. How does he do it? 
Well, I think first Joseph takes ownership of his part of the conflict. To me, that is the key that unlocks the door to forgiveness and restoration and to reconciliation. Before I talk to them, I'm going to look inward into myself. And you know what? It may be all their fault. It shouldn't have happened. And man, they really messed up. But if I were honest, there's one or two things in me as well that don't belong. I'm not perfect in this. And the reason why we start there is because it begins to soften our own heart and diffuses the anger that is attached to the would-be explosive. It's why Jesus so carefully chooses his words. Like he chooses these on purpose in Matthew chapter 7 when he says, Hey, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye when there is a two-by-six in yours? He says, You're a hypocrite. He says, remove that plank, that long piece in yours so that you can see clearly to even start the conversation with the other. And that's what we want, right? To see clearly, to address things humbly. And a huge key to all of this, I don't want to go without saying this part. And this is what I believe Joseph teaches us in this, that Joseph is not expecting that his healing and his restoration comes from the conversation with his brothers. Let me explain this. Because a lot of times in conflict, we think if I can just prove them wrong and get them to admit that they did me wrong, if they could feel as bad as they made me feel, that something that they could say or do in the moment would then help heal the pain or the frustration that's in my heart. And it's not true. There may be a temporary feeling of satisfaction that they admitted that they were wrong, but only God can heal the pain and the hurt that is caused. And if we decide that our healing is only going to depend on if they respond well, well, then we're going to be stuck not being healed. Are you with me? If they apologize, then I'll be okay. The truth is you won't be. Because only God can heal the hurt that's there. And if our attempt is, I need them to admit that they're wrong so that I can be okay, well, then we're making it about the wrong thing. But if we invite God into the process, and it is a process, it can take some time, then then when we do get together, it becomes less about solving something, less about proving a point, and more about the place of my heart. Restoring a relationship gives God the opportunity to do what he can do because I'm doing what I can do, fighting for my heart, fighting for the friendship, the marriage, the relationships. How do I know that Joseph modeled this? Some of you are like, man, that was a lot you took from that one verse. Here's how I know. Genesis 41, years earlier, Joseph had two kids. This is years before this encounter. And he names the first child Manasseh, which means God has made me forget. God helped me to forget all of the trouble that was caused. And then he named the second child Ephraim, which means fruitful, that God has made me fruitful. Where? In the land of my suffering. This is so powerful. That God had already been doing a work of healing and a work of blessing long before this confrontation with his brothers, despite the pain and the hurt that had been caused. So how do you and I respond like Joseph? I think practically speaking, starting within us, within ourselves, means we start with God's presence first. That we don't create a space for the enemy to come in and reside. We actually create a space for Jesus to come in through prayer, through worship, through inviting him in to help come and heal the, the, our hearts and to start the process. Genesis 50, 20. Here's the next lesson. You intended... To harm me. Interesting. So the first lesson is, I'm not God. I can't judge you. I've got my own stuff. But the next is this, and you'll be able to breathe, some of you, on this one. The next is this. It's going to require you to be completely honest. You're going to have to be honest. And he didn't soften it. He said, hey, guys, you intended to hurt me. Because in conflict, we tend to live on two extremes. We're hurt and we need someone to know that we're really hurt and we want to put them in their place. Or we just kind of say, you know what? It wasn't that bad. I'm just so sorry. It's just fine. We're going to be fine. But wise, healthy conflict lands somewhere in the middle. 
Here's what happened. Here's how it made, we, made me feel. And we have to get to that place because anything other than that on the extremes will either become sin and we'll say something that we shouldn't or something will be left unsaid and those seeds of bitterness will remain. Are you with me, anybody? Are you, are you, are you tracking with me? I hope so. So it will require some honesty. And honesty doesn't just make it okay what they did. But for you to say you did that and it hurt, Joseph modeling it. Let's look at the third lesson, the rest of the verse. You intended to harm me, but here's so powerful. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Here's the third thing. Resolving conflict is going to require secure faith. Not not a casual faith. This is the part where you and I have to, to dig in for and really be anchored to go from ordinary to extraordinary in our relationships. You and I are going to have to have anchored faith, a trust that God is there, that he is aware, that no matter what we see or no matter how I feel in this moment, God is present, he is not absent, and he is at work taking whatever is happening and he will turn it into something good. And I don't always see it. In fact, I rarely see it when I'm in the middle of it, but I can be confident that he that began a good work in me will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And what I mean is this, God doesn't cause it, but God will use it all. Conflict does not have to stop the work of God in your life. Pain does not have to stop the will of God from coming to pass in your life. Disappointment can try and stop what God has destined for you. But the truth is, if I'm still breathing, then God is still building. If I am still seeking, then God can still save. If I'm still praying, God is still moving. If I'm still surrendering, God will still lead. If I'm still believing, God can still restore. The Apostle Paul was shipwrecked. They were on a small island. Didn't know what the next step was. Conflict. They built a fire because they were soaking wet and cold and they wanted to stay warm. And as they were warming themselves by the fire, a poisonous snake bit Paul's hand and wouldn't let go. And everyone's looking at her like, well, this guy's a, a goner. The snake's taking him out. He's done for. And Paul then just proceeds to shake the snake off. And three days later, he places those same hands, that same hand on an official in the town, and they were healed. So what I'm saying is that the same hand that the snake bit became the hand that the healing came through. So I'm trying to reiterate the life of Joseph saying, sometimes what was meant to harm you, God may just use to bring healing to other people. Paul said, the snake tried to take me out. They tried to take me out. But by God's power, I lived. And on the third day, your Bible says it was on the third day. That is not in there by accident. On the third day, resurrection power was released and healing took place. Joseph said, that didn't feel good what you did. It didn't look good. But God is still good. And he turned this whole thing around masterfully like he does for the saving of many lives. I'm telling you, Freedom Church, how you navigate this season of conflict and unresolved anger may just be the key, not just to your healing, but to someone else's. It starts with us. It'll take honesty. It'll require secure faith. God, I don't get it but I trust you. And here's the final thing. Joseph said, don't be afraid. I'll provide for you. You're going to be just fine. To which that is crazy to me. After everything that they did, he said, it's going to be okay. There's going to be help for you. All the pain, all the hurt, with no guarantee that they wouldn't hurt him again. Here's the lesson number four. It'll set you free. Joseph is free. When we do conflict resolution God's way, 
we are set free that no matter what the other person did or what their response is, when we walk it God's way, we're not held in bondage anymore by what they did, but God has done a work on the inside of us and it sets us free. Not free to be like, we're good, we're square, don't worry about it. No, free for a purpose, free to do good. Romans 12, 1 says, don't overcome evil with evil. Yes, it was hard, it shouldn't have happened. But don't overcome evil with evil, Freedom Church. Overcome evil with good. How you know you're healed is when you can respond like Joseph and you can bless those who have cursed you. Where you can pray for the person that has harmed you. Where you can believe the best for that person. And can I tell you, it's not for their sake. It's for yours. Because I don't want to give the enemy a seat at my table. And you expect me to be so raw and honest, and I will. Sometimes I will pray for their blessing when I don't mean it yet. No, Lord, let them feel a little bit longer, like after what they did. I don't mean it yet, but I still know I can't stay right here. I can't stay in a spot where every time their name is mentioned, my blood boils. Can't stay there because there's no blessing from God there. There's an empty seat reserved for the devil, and I just can't have that in my life. We're going to bless those who curse, be free from what they've done for us. And here's what I would say. There, there may need to be boundaries, of course. Wisdom may call for that. You can't just keep entering into dangerous, volatile situations. But boundaries don't stop prayer. What can you do to ensure that your heart stays okay? Because you're not responsible for them. You are responsible for you. And I don't know about you, but I need to be free in here to do the good that God has called me to do. Stand to your feet. Stand with me and stay with me. Close your eyes. I'll give you a moment to really surrender over to Jesus what it is that you're carrying that, first of all, I want to say I'm sorry. Sorry that you're carrying what you are. I know it's hard. What they did is hard. Maybe what you did, you know, man, that was hard and I'm seeking reconciliation and forgiveness. They just haven't given it to me yet. It's, it's hard to be in this spot. But can I say, if we can just keep a, a heart that is postured right before the Lord, I think he'll come in and do the work of healing. It may take some time, but rejoice because God's going to come through like he promised he would. If this word, if you identified with any part of this and just need prayer for a situation, just put your hands out in front of you, hold your hands up, and I'm just going to pray for you right now. Jesus, it's hard to hear that it starts with us. But Lord, I pray that we wouldn't let the difficulty of that keep us from posturing ourselves in the right way before you. Lord, what is in us? Search us, know us. Help me to guard my heart. Help us to guard our hearts and minds that our emotions aren't going to run ragged and control us, but we're going to begin to think the best about people, not the worst. Jesus, I ask in this moment that you would continue just to heal the hearts that have been hurt, forgive, wipe away the words that have been spoken that just stick to our hearts, uh, recreate an atmosphere around us filled with life, the things that have been destroyed. Help us speak words of praise and encouragement. Help us to be filled with faith, God, knowing that no matter what has happened to us, you can turn it all around for our good. And if you receive that prayer, say amen. Say amen and clap your hands. And come on, let's declare in faith what God can do. The resurrector of life. Come on, sing it out.